Patty liked his conversation the way he liked his gumbo. In public places, his voice would ring out across a room. Am I right or am I wrong? When we heard his voice saying those words, we knew Daddy was in the midst of some political discussion and he was making his point. We knew too, he was not going to let the person off the hook with some lukewarm, soupy response. With Daddy, you had to state your position. You had to show your commitment to your argument. Mr. O'Geese didn't want to hear what you kind of thought, usually too loudly. He would with his body and voice challenge the other person. Am I right or am I wrong? Born in the Bayou Land of Louisiana, I am the son of August and Ella Nakos. That needed saying because for you to understand the story I am about to tell, you need to know about my father. In Opelousas, Louisiana, in the heart of Bayou Country, everybody knew Daddy. August, his first name, is said as Ogeese by those who speak the Louisiana French Creole and Cajun. They put Mr. in front of it to show respect for the man who never had any trouble voicing his opinions. A true black Creole, Mr. O'Geese liked his gumbo to have a rich and dark root. The Holy Trinity, onions, bell pepper, celery, cooked into that root with garlic added and then chicken, a pack or two of dried shrimp, spicy sausage, oysters, cayenne pepper, salt, all cooked together in a thick, swampy blend for a couple of hours. When cooked, so all those ingredients had been slowly combined by the heat, and it was all poured over white rice, Daddy would eat. I remember eating with him and watching him take big spoonfuls of the hot gumbo into his mouth and start to sweat from his temples. Halfway through the bowl, sweat coming off his brow, he would look up, suck his thick lips, take a breath through those lips and exhaling and speaking at the same time say to our mother, Ella, that's a good gumbo. It was the mixture, the surprise of each mouthful, the spicy intensity of the combat between the flavors that he liked. Now, I am all too aware that you may believe that we black Creoles like our food to be spicy hot. Truth is, spicy hot has little to do with the way the Cajuns and we Creoles like our food down the bayou. Creole, if you don't know, means mixture. And mixture is the key to the food many think of as Cajun, but which is more accurately described as Creole, to capture the mix of cultures represented in the food of Acadiana. And that's the way Daddy liked his conversation, an intense mix of ideas that was so up close, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, in your face, it made you sweat from the temple. To show his appreciation when eating gumbo, Daddy would say to our mother, Ellen, that's a good gumbo. When engaged in conversation and debate, he would hope to appreciate your contribution to the discussion when his voice forcefully asked, am I right or am I wrong? Come on, he would be saying, come on. Bring all the ingredients with the spice included. Let me taste that gumbo. Come on. Make me sweat from the temples. Am I right or am I wrong? Those gumbo origins I took with me when I became North Carolina State University's first Vice Provost for Diversity in African American Affairs. Even while being interviewed for the position, I made it clear that my approach to diversity would be based on the need for and the requirement of a conflict of ideas. I thought my job was to help make gumbo, to create a mix of people that leads to a conflict of ideas that generates a new, dynamic set of relationships between people. It was only a little while before I began to realize that the hidden job description was to leave people in their segregated enclaves and to feed them an already overcooked, unseasoned, bland soup. After only two years, I resigned. For you to really understand what happened, there are some things you need to see and hear, events in my professional life and in the life of my family. So, we begin in the midst of my time as Vice Provost. 
at that beginning, I show you my own situation as a university professor. The state of the discussion of diversity at North Carolina State University, along with relevant elements of my family background. Then I give you more information by taking you into my time in the United States Navy, showing how that experience shaped my desire to work on diversity issues. After that, we spring forward back to the point where I am moving into the new university diversity position, laying out some of my ideas and motivations. From that point on, we live in the story of my two years as vice provost with an up close look at the goings on around diversity in the university, resistance to change from all sides, and a fear and loathing for diversity at the highest level of the university administration. With the emphasis being on the story of what happened, I also relate stories of my family, Mr. O'Geese, Miss Ellen, my sister, and brothers. Stories that further illuminate my background and that sustained me all of my life. And through those two years of turmoil, up to the time the memo announcing my resignation were circulated around campus. When that memo went public, word was, Dr. Narcos has decided to return to the classroom to teach. Truth is, no one except me knows the real story behind my resignation. It is a story that begins with my growth, development, and movement into the work of diversity in the academy. But mine is also a story of what the modern university sometimes means by diversity. It is a story with the message that when you look at the nature of leadership in the modern university, something has gone wrong. I'd like to tell you of the turn of events I lived through as vice provost, a cautionary tale of the uncultured palate of the modern university. Come further into my kitchen with me and sit with me. I'll make a gumbo while I tell you what really happened.